Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much indeed for joining this evening's presentation, um, which is also with the statutory duty of candour. Hopefully everything you will need to know and ever wanted to know. Um, I'm delighted to be joined this evening by two uh, very senior and experienced colleagues here at the MDU. Uh, both of whom are doctors, um, Mr. Gerard Ross, um, who was a neurosurgeon before joining the uh, MDU, uh, and also my colleague, Dr. Ed Farnan, who, like me, was a GP. Um, as I say, my name is Michael Devlin. I've been with the MDU for quite a few years now, more than I care to remember. Um, and I'm Head of Professional Standards and Liaison um, here. Uh, before that, um, I headed up our advisory department, so um, I've seen a fair few files over the years and one of my interests uh, has been duty of candour. If I could just deal with a couple of housekeeping points first. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we do really encourage questions from you. Um, please could you send those in as early as you can. If you can make them clear, concise um, and uh, as to the points as you possibly can, that would be great. Um, I hope to, that we can get through as many of those as we can. We will do that at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, I know some people will be disappointed because of the numbers we tend to get. It will be impossible to cover each and every one, um, but my colleagues will try and pick out representative questions that several people have asked. Um, I'm also reminded to let you know that your certificate of attendance will uh, be with you by the end of the week. Um, so hopefully you won't have too long to wait for that. So without further ado, uh, I will go on to the first slide. And this is just a very quick overview um, of the main points uh, in today's session. So it's all about understanding duty of candour, uh, comparing that to the ethical duty to know when each applies. And also say a little bit about what makes an effective apology. And although it's not a learning objective, um, a bit of the talk at the end is all to do with what the impact of the statutory duty of candour has been. So I'll just take you through some of the evidence uh, in case that's of interest. Now, many of you will be aware where the statutory duty of candour had its origins. Uh, it goes back to the Mid-Staffs Inquiry with, that was chaired by uh, Robert Francis, QC. Um, Robert Francis is an extremely experienced advocate. He's worked in medical law for decades and decades and decades. Um, indeed, I've worked with him on several cases over the years. Um, consequently, he did bring a lot of insight into that particular inquiry, and he was able to get through to what the nub of the problem was in his view. Um, and one of the real concerns that he uncovered was that all, when things went wrong, there was a tendency to brush it all under the carpet. So no one was telling each other what the problems were. And more importantly, no one was telling patients when things went wrong or indeed their uh, relatives. So in his report, one of his recommendations was that going forward, there should be a statutory duty of candour. So that's in addition to anything the GMC might require of you. Um, but that statutory duty of candour uh, would be in respect of organisations rather than individuals. This is just a very quick snapshot um, of what statutory duty of candour looks like in the four UK countries at the moment. We've had most experience in England and I'm going to reconcentrate really on England tonight but Scotland introduced its own uh, statutory duty in 2018. Wales, that's now on the statute books. It'll be implemented in 2023, and next year there'll be consultation on the regulations. I'm going to come back to Northern Ireland a little bit later on, so I won't say too much about that for now. I've already hinted that there's both ethical and uh, statutory duty to candor. The way I like to think of this is that if you're looking at telling patients what happened when things go wrong, everything is neatly encompassed with the ethical duty, which is a very broad duty. And you could almost think of the statutory duty as being a subset of that. So the statutory duty, that's uh, set out in regulations. You can see a little picture of that on the screen. And the ethical duty, that was uh, updated and a joint statement was reached with other uh, regulators, and in particular the NMC, and again, you can see a little snapshot of that. Um, I'll say a little bit more about what those duties 
actually require of you, but that's just to see how they relate to each other. So both are there, they both exist, and they exist in slightly different ways. Why is it important? Um, I really don't want to teach you to suck eggs, but hopefully this will make a little bit of sense to you. Um, it's about promoting mutual trust and respect. I think that makes sense. It's also said to help promote learning from patient safety incidents. And again, that's something I think we would all support. Uh, it's consistent with doctors' ethical obligations. Well, you've seen that in the previous slide. The last point, and you might be perhaps less enamored with this concept, but it encourages comprehensive documentation and recording of patient safety incidents. In fact, that's not quite as bad as it sounds because of course that's something that you probably do anyway. So it simply complements actions that should already be happening. But really in my view, the most important thing is the top left-hand corner there. It helps to secure a really good constructive mutual respect with your patients. So that's, that's the one point I'd like you to take away from that slide. Now, I mentioned the ethical duty, and what it says is as follows. So you must be open and honest with patients when something causes or has the potential to cause harm or distress. And just a word or two about the language here. The GMC, in its guidance, is very careful and consistent with its use of words. So we use the word must where there is an absolute obligation on you to do something. If it's less of an obligation, but it's something that is likely to be required in many circumstances, you use the word should. But you see here it is must. It is an obligation. And the second part of it is what the duty actually entails. So this is the ethical duty. So you've got to tell the patient when something has gone wrong or their family member to apologise to them. Put that right if that's possible. Sometimes it's not. And also to have a discussion with them, a dialogue about the likely short and long-term effects of what's gone wrong. Now, I wanted to say a word or two about apologies too. Um, this is something that we come across uh, day in and day out. Um, there is a real concern that if you give an apology, uh, it's somehow going to be construed as an admission of liability. I've often wondered where this comes from, because certainly for as long as I've been at the MDU and for many decades before, we've been encouraging doctors to apologise to patients when things go wrong. So the concept of saying sorry is by no means new, but I think it possibly comes from things like motor insurance. If you're in an accident, uh, your insurer would expect you not to say anything without their agreement. Uh, but really, that's not the situation here. And Again, looking at uh, English law, the Compensation Act, Section 2, makes it quite clear that apology is not in itself an admission of liability. Uh, what was called NHS Litigation Authority, that's the organisation that indemnifies trusts, and now GPs in England, um, produced some really useful guidance in 2019 uh, called Saying Sorry. And what they do is they underline this point that an apology is not an admission of liability. So they have four points they like to bring out. It's always the right thing to do. As I've said, it's not an admission of liability. It acknowledges that something could have done better. And also it reinforces this learning point that we saw on the previous slide. So learn from it and try and prevent it from happening in the future. And interestingly enough, that final bullet point is something you very often hear patients saying that's what they want to get out of these types of processes. So this is a little bit of practical advice. What makes an effective apology? Well, first point, face-to-face -face is usually best. That goes without saying, I'm sure you know that. Sending an apology by text is not the same as seeing someone face-to-face. -face. The second point I think is really important. Speak in plain English, do it naturally. It's a natural conversation. It needn't be stilted. It needn't be dripping with technical language patient probably won't appreciate that and indeed they might not understand all of what you're trying to say. Uh, it's perfectly acceptable to say I'm really sorry for what happened. Uh, we didn't intend the treatment to turn out in that way. I'm sorry that you had pain, distress, whatever it happens to be. So speak plainly. 
Um, setting the scene is important, uh, give it context, because once you set that scene, an apology can often just be the natural end point. And it's also a dialogue. I've used that word a couple of slides back, uh, but it really is a dialogue. If it's just one way traffic, um, you'll probably get less out of that discussion than if you apologize, you hear what the patient has to say. Um, they may well, and our experience is often, that they respond really positively um, and they tell you how much they appreciate what you've said. Final point also is really important, privacy and body language. So what do I mean by privacy? Well, let's say you're on a busy ward round and the patient is surrounded by maybe half a dozen doctors and nurses and OTs and everyone else. Um, that's not a great situation um, to provide an apology in this type of uh, scenario. And think also about body language. Uh, imagine the uh, patient is in the consultation room with you. Uh, if your arms are crossed, you're leaning backwards uh, with a frown on your face. Um, it's not really sending out the same message that if you are sitting there leaning towards the patient, open posture and being attentive to them. I know you're all experts uh, in communication. Doctors are by and large excellent communicators, but some of these simple points, um, I think it is worth emphasizing. So we have some polls, and I forgot to tell you about this in the beginning, um, where we invite you to give your responses um, to some little questions we put up. So the first one is, are you aware of the statutory duty of candor? So uh, the poll is now open and uh, you are invited to make your response. So I'm just seeing we're up to about a third of you has voted so far. And I think it's fair to say that there's a, a one third, two thirds split. So two thirds of people, I think, are familiar with the uh, duty of candor, the statutory duty of candor. Um, sorry, one third, I should say, is very familiar, and two thirds are, know a little bit about it. A very small proportion of you aren't aware of it at all. So well done, and uh, that's a good start, I think. So now just. Um, <clears throat> returning to the uh, screen and I shall go on to the next slide which is uh, the statutory duty of candor and the high level principles. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that it applies to organizations and again I'm talking about um, England and indeed Scotland here. Uh, we've talked about apologies, uh, it really is a central part of the statutory duty. I'm going to come to this in a bit more detail, but there is a fairly complex threshold, uh, but I can say in broad terms that it's really moderate harm or worse. It does require assessment of that threshold by an independent healthcare professional. And the last thing is that staff must be offered support. Um, that obviously depends on the nature of the incident, the experience of the staff and so on and so forth. So it's likely um, a consultant who's been in practice for many years will need rather less support than someone facing their first uh, patient safety incident where someone maybe is quite severely harmed. So on to another poll question and this one is have you ever felt that you couldn't be open with a patient if something went wrong? So if you'd like to respond to that poll which I think should be now open or should be opening very soon. So about up to coming up for a third of you voting. And this is, this is a fairly interesting split actually. Um, a third of you say um, that no, you've never felt that you couldn't be open. Sorry, almost a half of you have said no, um, you have never felt that you couldn't be open and approximately the other half uh, say that yes, that does happen occasionally. So we will close that poll and thank you for that.
And the next um, slide is one that deals with uh, the individual obligations in the statutory duty of candor. Um, this is a schematic um, and the really important point I'd like to get across is uh, the first point, sorry, the second point as you read along. So that's understanding and following your organization's uh, clinical governance procedures. Um, that's because it's an organizational duty, but of course the organization doesn't really know about what's going on until they're told. So once they're told, then they can set uh, the various train in motion as to what needs to happen next. Um, those of you who are senior clinicians um, may well have already experienced um, having discussions with patients under your um, statutory duty of candor processes. Uh, the final point just to emphasize is that if you fail to do so, then there are teeth here. Um, although there is no punishment as part of the statutory duty itself, what tends to happen is that you will be subject to disciplinary procedures by your employer, and they may well also refer you to the GMC. So it is important and really vital um, that you do make sure that you follow what your organization expects you to do in those circumstances. So just moving along to the next slide. And this is um, a little bit um, similar to what we've just touched on before but it does set out what exactly the statutory duty entails in England. So it emphasizes that there is actually a general duty on organizations to act in an open and transparent way. So as well as having the process, the procedure itself, there is also this general obligation. So what must happen? Well, after a notifiable patient safety incident has occurred, and we'll explain what that is, you need to tell the patient or the representative as soon as is reasonably practicable, so i.e. pretty soon after the incident. You give the patient as full an explanation as you know at the time, you give an apology, keep a written record of what you've said to the patient, and also provide reasonable support to the patient. We mentioned previously that support is available to staff, but it's important that patients are supported too uh, through this process. So this notifiable safety incident, what exactly is it? Well, it's an unintended or unexpected incident. So important is the word or there, it's not and, so it can be either of those. That instance occurred in respect uh, of a patient during the provision of a regulated activity. That's uh, the Care Quality Commission language for essentially clinical care. And that's in the reasonable opinion of the healthcare professional appears to have resulted in or could result in certain specified serious incidents. So it's not that you have to be certain that something has caused the adverse outcome, but you just have to be have a reasonable suspicion that that's the case. And it's also important to look at the wording or could result in. So that, that is quite distinct from saying or could have resulted in. It means that something could result in the future. So for example, hypoxic ischemic encephalitis, sorry, encephalopathy um, in a baby may well result um, in residual neurological disability as they get older. It might not be apparent straight away, but it might not be apparent also for years. So that's when that tends to apply. <clears throat> so what is uh, one of these um, incidents? Well, it occurs where there's death, severe harm or moderate harm. Also, if there's prolonged psychological harm or prolonged pain and prolonged in those two circumstances means 28 days or more. And as I've intimated, it doesn't apply to no harm, low harm or indeed to near miss incidents. So bear that in mind, it's moderate harm or worse, along with prolonged psychological harm or prolonged pain. So a couple of related poll questions for you to consider here. Um, so the first of these is, have you been involved in a notifiable patient safety incident which triggered complying with the duty of candor? So this is a two-parter because it depends whether you answer yes or no. 
So about a quarter of you have voted so far. And approximately, well, just over half have said no. Um, so we'll close that and we'll go on to the uh, next question, um, which is, um, so I'll just go back to my slide. Uh, if yes, how did you respond to the patient or their representative? So, as expected, a lot of you haven't been involved, so therefore uh, that's the biggest selection of answers so far. But really good to see um, that a lot of you are ticking all the right boxes here. Only 2% have said that no response was provided, 23% have said provided an, an explanation, 24% uh, have apologised. So that's great. So we'll close that uh, poll now and just return to these slides. So um, we're just going to talk about thresholds for the next uh, few slides. And I'm just going to give you the definitions first, and then we're going to go through a few examples. So this is what it says about severe harm. So it's a permanent lessening of bodily, sensory, motor, physiological, and intellectual functions. And it gives some examples of what that means. Um, so it could be removal of the wrong limb, organ or brain damage. So things that are very clearly and very obviously a, a very severe outcome. Uh, moderate harm, um, this is a little bit more difficult to understand and define but it talks about things like a moderate increase in treatment and uh, significant but not permanent harm. So moderate increase in treatment, for example, could be an unplanned return to surgery. A prolonged episode of care could be extra time in hospital or having to attend frequently as an outpatient. So here are some examples. So the first of these, the patient has an excision of a basal cell carcinoma. Uh, they develop a wound infection and it requires 10 days of antibiotics. So would this trigger the statutory duty? Well, in our view, it could or it couldn't. It could be uh, interpreted either way. But the reason I've used this example is I think it's really important. If it's a question, yes or no, essentially, choose yes. If there's any doubt at all, the safe thing to do is to assume the statutory duty applies. Uh, you're much less likely as an organisation to get into difficulty if you do that. So the second example, um, patients told by their doctor that a lung lesion on the x-ray was likely to be cancer. An MR scan later shows that to be an artefact. Um, when the patient is next seen, they say that they've been very stressed for the last five weeks. And we think that does engage the statutory duty of candor. Don't forget the patient is giving you a clear history there of uh, a significant amount of psychological distress for over 28 days. And the third example there, following a fall, the patient has a colleague's fracture reduced and immobilized, but after the cast was removed, the reduction wasn't as successful as hoped and there's an appreciable residual dorsal displacement. So have a guess. And I suspect like most of you would have thought yes, because that's a permanent change to the bodily integrity of that individual. It's not as planned. They're left with a deformity that certainly wasn't uh, intended. A couple more examples. So the first one, emergency cesarean section required for a uh, sorry, required a transfusion. Um, it was noted by the midwife just before putting up the blood that it looked to be a different blood group. Uh, it wasn't given and its subsequent investigation showed that the two samples taken from patients on the same ward had been inadvertently switched. 
So the patient suffered no ill effects, but let's face it, it could have been a very serious outcome. So does this engage the statutory duty of candor? Well, the answer is no, because this is a classic near miss. Um, and the phrase to look at there could have, it didn't happen. Um, and they aren't going to die by not having received the wrong blood. Looking at the next example, uh, this is a patient has a steroid injection into her knee. Um, she is obese and subsequent to that had a continuous sharp burning, burning pain immediately uh, on the same side as the injection. Uh, seen by the rheumatologist who concludes that the injection had damaged the saphenous nerve and thought this likely happened because of the uh, patient's obesity. Uh, the pain was thought likely to become chronic. Again, have a think about whether you think it's engaged or not on this occasion. And we think the answer to that is yes, because we're looking now at the situation of chronic pain. And you'll remember a, a pain that's likely to last more than 28 days uh, will fulfill the criteria. So last couple of examples about the thresholds. And the first of these is a patient who's inadvertently given unopposed estrogen for menopausal symptoms. This required in postmenopausal bleeding that required referral and further investigation. Uh, the patient during this period was increasingly tearful and fearing the worst. So does that trigger the statutory duty of candor? Yes, we think it does for a couple of reasons. There's clearly um, increased treatment that's required. It's further referral, further investigation. Um, and although we don't know how long the patient was distressed for, it could well have been a long time uh, if that referral took some time to uh, arrive and be actioned. And the final example, so you're a GP looking, at a, looking after a 71 year old woman who has got apathy and memory loss and you've diagnosed dementia. She's treated for several months in the memory service before a re-evaluation is undertaken and she's then diagnosed with depression and that uh, happily responds to antidepressant treatment. So how about this case? That's quite interesting. Do you think it does or doesn't uh, trigger the duty? Well, we think it does. Um, again, the difficulty here is that um, the diagnosis that was incorrect um, has led to the patient receiving essentially the wrong treatment uh, for several months. Um, and it was only when that diagnosis was re-evaluated that she then got the right treatments and responded to that. And you've probably seen the sort of theme here is that um, if you're at all in any doubt, um, it is always safer to say yes. So um, on our final poll question, and uh, this one is, uh, do known complications trigger the statutory duty of candor, even if discussion of these formed part of the consent process? So um, that poll is now open. That's great. My job is made so much easier. A clear two thirds, I think, have said yes. Um, a reasonable portion don't know, and about a fifth say no. So we'll close that poll now. Um, but thank you for those responses. And I shall just return to my slides. So, what about known complications? Well, those of you who thought that known complications, if they arise, do trigger the statutory duty of candor are absolutely right. And here's a salient example. Uh, and this does two things. One of those is that it does, in fact, show that yes, a known complication will trigger the statutory duty. But it also shows that uh, the statutory duty of candor does have teeth. Um, as you know, and as we touched on earlier, um, it's the CQC, the regulator of healthcare organisations in England, uh, that is responsible for ensuring um, that it is followed, and they do have powers to prosecute when it doesn't. Uh, and in this case, it was a patient who died uh, following esophageal perforation after an endoscopy. And you can see that the fines in total were quite significant, uh, over 10,000 pounds. 
uh, and led to this comment from the Deputy Chief Inspector of Hospitals. He's saying that all care providers have a duty to be open and transparent with patients and their loved ones, particularly when something goes wrong. And this case sends a clear message that we will not hesitate to take action when that does not happen. I'm just coming to the last uh, portion of the uh, presentation now. And as I said, I was going to take you through um, some of the evidence uh, that relates to duty of candor. So the first of these uh, is in relation, odd enough, not to the statutory duty, uh, but to the ethical duty. And um, this is from the GMC's own data uh, from 2019. Um, and over a five year period, 2014 to 2018, there was 525 cases uh, that they received, i.e. complaints that they received. Reassuringly, in about three quarters of those, uh, no further action was taken or indeed was necessary. 10% um, were subject to either advice or a warning. So that's something short of needing specific action on your registration. 5%, so a relatively small number, were dealt with by way of what we call undertakings. That's when a doctor agrees with the GMC that they will not repeat something that they've done before, uh, or they will do things in a different way. But only 11% ended up being referred to a full tribunal hearing. Um, that's reassuring. In my view, those figures demonstrate that doctors actually are doing the right thing. Uh, that the numbers, first of all, are relatively small, um, and those cases that are considered, the majority are closed with no further action, which is exactly as you might expect it to be. The uh, next uh, bit of research is from the Professional Standards Authority. Probably just helps if I explain that that organisation oversees all the regulators, so the General Medical Council, Nursing and Midwifery Council, General Dental Council, and so forth. Um, and two years ago, they uh, looked at um, how effective the duty of candor seemed to be. Um, I think this is some really interesting research because they found inhibitors and enablers. And what were those inhibitors? Well, it was fear. It was fear of litigation, fear of action being taken by the GMC, and also fear of the adverse publicity that. Uh, might follow uh, having to tell the patient that something went wrong. Conversely, what are the enablers? Well, this is just as you might expect. If there is an organisation with an open and just culture, a just and learning culture, um, then that is much more likely uh, to enable staff to do the right thing and to tell patients when something goes wrong. Also, when things are done quickly, uh, the longer it goes on, the more difficult it is to um, carry out the statutory duty or indeed even the ethical duty. Um, and also education and training. So organisations that take this seriously, that take their staff through what their obligations are, what they should be doing, they tend to do better than those uh, organisations that don't have that approach to training. Here's another bit of research, uh, this time from the Universities of Manchester and Birmingham, along with the Nuffield Trust. Um, it's a year older, January 2018. Um, I've got this and I'm flagging it up partly because there is so little research done uh, by organisations into the effectiveness uh, or implications of the duty of candour. But this is, I think, quite useful because it does um, show a few positives. First of all, they found that there was an increase in openness of culture in organisations. Uh, it found there were net reputational benefits and it also found that it increased patient confidence. So there were tangible and very useful benefits. But there's a but. Uh, what they found was that there was little change in complaints or litigation rates. And although that's a but, I think the first three points in that list speak for themselves. It is still worth doing, even if it doesn't affect the bottom line. So you still end up with complaints or you still end up with claims. That's not an excuse to disregard the duty of candour, because going back to the very early part of the presentation, don't forget it's all about uh, trying to 
ensure that that mutual trust and respect is the cornerstone of the doctor-patient relationship is preserved. And the last area I was going to touch on um, is what's planned in Northern Ireland. Um, the genesis in Northern Ireland has been a little bit difficult, although it's been watching carefully what's been happening elsewhere in UK. The real driver in Northern Ireland has been a public inquiry um, into hyponatremia related deaths. Uh, this relates to a small number of children who died um, in the early 1990s following uh, overtransfusion with fifth normal saline. Um, the inquiry went on for a really quite a long time, but did eventually report in January 2018. The judge-led inquiry found as follows. First of all, that there should be an organisational duty of candour. Well, that's fine um, because that exists elsewhere in UK. So nothing particularly uh, concerning about that. But unlike anywhere else in UK, uh, it was uh, recommended that there be an individual duty of candour. So as well as requiring organisations to do certain things, it would also require individuals to do certain things. And the really concerning point is the second one, which says that criminal liability should attach to breach of this duty. And criminal liability should attach to obstruction of another in the performance of this duty. That's a real concern. Why is it a concern? Well, it's, it's yet another example of the creeping criminalisation of healthcare. Um, you can cast your minds back, I'm sure those who are old enough, um, of the problems that we saw for many years with Finn Christie, where there was inadvertent uh, infusion intrathecally rather than, than intravenously, causing the death of patients. Um, that led to several prosecutions, um, several of them successful against doctors. Um, whilst all that was going on, uh, the mistakes kept happening so there was always a risk of prosecution for gross negligence manslaughter. Uh, did that risk of prosecution stop it from happening? No, it didn't. What actually stopped it from happening were proper, good patient safety investigations that ensured that there were things like engineered solutions to make sure that that couldn't, couldn't happen. Sorry, my slides are just playing up. So this resulted in a consultation. That consultation closed uh, on the 2nd of August. So too late now to um, have any influence on what the policymakers in Northern Ireland will do. Um, the responses to that consultation have just been published beginning of this week it will be considered by the Assembly and ultimately the Northern Ireland Assembly will decide whether or not this is something that will uh, fo be followed through and be quite distinct from the rest of the UK and result in criminal sanctions. We sincerely hope it doesn't and we're going to continue working hard on your behalf to make sure that that doesn't happen. So just coming to the end now, um, summary points. First of all, just to reassure you that really all the evidence suggests that the professional duty as it exists is really effective. And we've seen that with the GMC stats. There are really complex thresholds with the statutory duty uh, and there are processes that must be followed. Although those obligations are on the organisation, it's important that you know what your current, your local arrangements are. We saw from the PSC, the PSA research, that fear is the most potent inhibitor of candor and organizational culture, the best enabler. And as I've touched on, there is actually little research that's done. So any of you budding researchers out there, this would be a really good uh, area to study um, if that is your thing. And also uh, my final point that uh, there is no evidence at all that criminalizing healthcare reduces harms. Uh, you don't need me to tell you about the high profile cases of David Selu, Honey Rose and Dr. Bauer Garber, but certainly it put fear uh, into the profession and it was really negative. We know that what tends to go wrong happens on, in the main because of systemic factors. And also 
we know that fear and openness pull in opposite directions. So that concludes my uh, presentation. So what I hope to do now is to uh, move on to our discussion and to invite my two colleagues, uh, Ed and Gerard, to uh, join us. Ed, Gerard, thank you very much. And I know um, in the background, whilst uh, I've been going through the presentation, you've been kindly going through the questions, uh, picking out some that we might be able to discuss to discuss as a trio. So, um, Gerard, shall I go to you first and uh, ask yeah, what question you'd like to start with? I do have one here. Let me just get the question up. There we are. Um, one of our uh, audience members is a medical legal uh, expert in as much as they do expert witness work and they've said that I recognise an apology is not considered to be an admission of guilt but as a e medical expert dealing with clinical negligence cases it's not uncommon for the claimant solicitors to include um, such an apology, apology in the letter of claim. The implication is that that's of legal relevance so, is any comments on that from you, Mike, or, or uh, Ed? Um, Ed, would you like to go first, and I'll chip in? Yeah, I, I, I've had a similar query here. Somebody saying essentially they're concerned that you know an apology which is properly meaningful and sincere might in itself imply some degree of liability. And so, it's obviously it's a it's a common theme across various doctors who who've contacted us. I think the important thing is that there is protection in law, both in England and Wales and in Scotland, uh, for apologies um, which are made in this context. Unfortunately, the position is not quite the same in Northern Ireland as yet. One of the things which is which is coming through as part of this consultation that you referred to, Mike, is that there may well be some sort of legislation passed as part of the statutory duty in Northern Ireland which would offer the same protections. But yes, I think the, the important point is that a, an apology in itself is not an admission of guilt, it's not a, an admission of liability, and it is protected as such in, in statute. Thanks, um, Ed. I mean, my, my only observation in addition to what you said, and I agree entirely, is of course, we've got NHS resolution um, setting out in very clear terms in its 2019 uh, publication that it is not an admission of liability. Um, but I think the expert who asked the question is absolutely right. Does that preclude uh, claimant lawyers raising it? No, it doesn't. Um, but I have to say they are wasting their time because courts, these, if these matters ever do get to court, and relatively few do, um, it's not something that they will uh, put any weight towards. Gerard, is there, is, is there a caveat to that, Mike, in as much as it might be possible for somebody to make an inadvertent admission uh, during discussion of a case, you know, I'm sorry that I did this to you and that caused this to happen? I think it's really unlikely. Um, you would have to almost go to extreme lengths um, to say, I am really sorry for what happened. Um, I think I was negligent in what I did. And I think that my negligence caused the harm um, yeah. that you're so now um, experiencing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think um, an apology, which is why, if you remember the uh, slide that was on how to give a, an apology, the sort of practical tips, if you like, talked about using normal, everyday, non-technical language. I think if you do that, you must, you're much less likely to um, get into difficulties. I think if, if doctors are worried about the wording of that, they're, they're more than welcome to contact us. We're very happy to review any, any apology that they might be sending out before it's sent, just to make sure that they don't say anything. And of in, course, in, in England as well, um, it's not unusual, and in Wales, it's not unusual at all for doctors to communicate with state backed indemnity providers about what they're putting in, in their letters uh, to the patients about uh, things that have caused complaints or, or have caused concern. So there, there is a sort of a, a, we can certainly look at things, but the other the state backed indemnifiers can also do so. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, thank you for that question. I wonder, Ed, whether you've got as uh, a question there. Yeah, I've got a, a couple which are sort of slightly related. Uh, one doctor says that you know his difficulty with the duty of candour and putting it into action is that 
he feels that at times it might be seen as he's blaming somebody else. So perhaps if he spotted an error or something like that that somebody else may have made, he's got a concern about that. And a, a related question about one of your examples um, about the you know the, the patient diagnosed in, inadvertently with dementia who turned out to be depressed. If this was something which has happened some time ago, maybe years ago, uh, and the patient has been treated for dementia for a long time, and now a new doctor takes over their care and makes this diagnosis, what are the implications for the doctor and where, where does his responsibility lie? Both of those really good points. Gerard, what do you think? Well, I think it's important to put the patient at the centre of the decision making and the discussion about this, to make sure that they understand what's going on. It's not about um, making sure that you're being kind to a, to a, another doctor and, and not, uh, not mentioning it. I think it's important to be clear about what you've found and if questions are asked about previous previous interactions that it's that it's um it's flagged up that it may have been relevant i mean i, I it happened to me when I, I i remember seeing somebody with depression who actually had a, a very very large um frontal meningioma which had been undiagnosed for a long time um and that was it was relevant to to the presentation and would have been relevant for some time so yeah i think you have to put that aside slightly and recognize that as doctors we we will all make mistakes and, and that's entirely normal and sharing the information with the people who are most affected is the most appropriate thing to do and it's not about protecting or not protecting somebody else or criticizing somebody else because we could all learn from each other's errors. Yeah I agree with that entirely I mean I, I would all also make the point because it's a it's a really understandable sentiment I think the one that's been expressed in that um, question um, what all the guidance says is that the duty of candor is not about blame and the organizations that do this well are ones as we've touched on have this uh, no blame ie a just and learning culture um, so I would I would hope the more this is established throughout the NHS and UK the less we'll be seeing those kinds of concerns. Um, Ed, did you have any thoughts? No, I agree, and I think the important thing is there was the doctor there was concerned about being seen to blame others, and I think the important point is that it, you know if this is done right, there shouldn't be a blame culture attached to it. Yeah, but I think it comes out in some of the other questions that we've had. There, there's it's more observations I think that people have that, um, particularly in the last eighteen months or so, but going back longer, the, the organizational responses have sometimes been suboptimal and with emails pinging to and from between um, different le levels of management in the organization I think that's something that we that I have certainly seen uh, for our members having to cope with it at the sharp end so that's not a question it's an observation that a couple of people have made in, in the comments I think I, I think that that's really helpful you know because one of the things that I keep hearing year in year out is that um, really dedicated um, staff who know that it's the right thing to do will very often say that the one thing that really is lacking is they never get any feedback so they might let the organization know this has happened and then it basically goes into black hole they never hear about it ever again um, and it's such a shame because um, organizations that as we've said do it well will be much more inclined to share that information so that everyone has a chance to say, yeah, I raised this, it was really interesting, this is what we have learned out of it. Yeah. Gerard, any, any further questions that you think we should uh, look at? Yeah, I'm just gonna uh, pull them up. They're coming in quite thick and fast. Uh, give me a second to find um, something. And if you've got one to hand, please go ahead. Yeah, there's, again, there's there's a couple here which might be sort of slightly related. Um, one is saying really to to which near misses does this apply? And I think the, the emphasis there would be probably more on the professional and ethical duty of candour, which is where the, the near misses are likely to be caught. Uh, the statutory duty is less likely to apply for near misses, I think, because the thresholds require to some extent a degree of harm to have occurred. So it's by definition not a near miss. So even though the statutory duty doesn't apply, I think the professional and, and ethical duty will apply at that lower threshold. I think I think that's right, and I, I think that's where professional judgment comes in, um, because it's that balance, isn't it? Uh, on the one hand, 
you will get near misses in clinical practice because it's busy and everyone's working ferociously hard and probably 10 times worse during um, COVID. Um, but just because it's happened, um, it doesn't mean to say that patients can't be told about a sort of near miss. Uh, yeah. On the one hand, you won't want to um, cause anxiety and um, lack of or diminishing trust in the organisation. But on the other hand, you don't want to be accused of covering things up. So if, if for example, um, another member of staff mentions, gosh, you know, that, that was a close one yesterday, uh, we almost put the wrong blood up, and that's the first the patient gets to sort of hear about it. Okay, might not have triggered the statutory duty, but perhaps if you had told the sub patient from the outset, um, and they would they didn't get to hear it secondhand. Chair, I do have any thoughts. We had lots of questions about um, complications while you were talking, and before you actually got to that part of your um, talk, a lot of doctors were asking, a lot of people in the audience were asking about complications and the duty of candour. And I think I think you've covered a bit. Somebody said something quite interesting, which was that you know, if known complications are subject to the duty of candour, surely there's a a massive underreporting. And, and anecdotally, and it is only anecdote in terms of my experience of speaking to doctors on the advice line. It would be the, the the vast majority of those would be me mentioning the statutory duty of candour and at times even the ethical duty of candour, um, rather than volunteering a discussion about it. Um, I, I can I can I can't recall the last time somebody phoned me and asked me about a statutory of quest, statutory duty of candour question, but I have got many instances when it was fairly clear to me that the statutory of candour was likely to be engaged and should certainly be considered. So in answer to the, the, that observation from one of the, the audience members, I absolutely think that there's almost certainly a significant under-reporting of, of the duty of candour, uh, of, of things that reach threshold for the statutory duty of candour. That's really helpful, Gerard. And, and maybe you know that's one of the things that you could take away from uh, this evening's presentation, because um, I know my expert and experienced colleagues uh, do come across this often and it is one of those those myths that just because it's a known complication it can't possibly uh, trigger the duty whereas hopefully what you've learned this evening is oh but it can um, the duty of candor is all about outcomes it's not about the uh, process that led to that outcome necessarily i mean i think there's a degree of nuance in it so, uh, we've got an itu consultant asking about you know, ventilator associated complications and, and um, whether they need to be disclosed. And, you know, I spent time dealing with a lot of ventilated patients, not all because of what I did, but because of, of the diseases with which I dealt. And um, obviously some did develop serious and unexpected or, or serious um, complications of of ventilation which were not run of the mill. I think if you developed a, a minor chest infection which didn't have a major impact because it's part of what you it's a normal course of event yeah. events within the ITU for that to occur. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not an intensivist but that's certainly my experience. Whereas I think if somebody were to develop an empyema and have a, a loculate empyema or multiple um, chest strains requiring to go in over many months that would I think be reaching to a different different threshold uh, and probably would start engaging the duty of candour. Um, it's not a direct answer to the question that the person in the audience has, has answered, has asked, but I think it's about nuance, it's about um, the seriousness of the complication to some extent, the impact on the patient, that's obviously obviously implicit in the statute, and um, uh, there, I think if you were to say that every chest infection in ITU was a duty of candour issue, I think you'd be reporting almost every single ventilated patient who's there for more than 48 hours, and that's not the purpose of, of, the, yeah. of the legislation. It's got to be moderate, moderate harm or sort of worse, and, and as, as we've seen, moderate harm is not an exact science in knowing when something is moderate harm or sort of not, so you're absolutely right, it is nuanced, um, and certainly we wouldn't want to be too broad brush in our approach here. Yeah, I think okay. perhaps uh, we didn't get the nuance across perhaps as much as we might have done. And, Ed, I think we might have time for one one more question before we close. Yeah, I think there was a couple fairly early on, which were on a on a related note, which was essentially how does the the duty of candour process play in with the complaints process? One 
One doctor asked, why do we advise not to reply to a duty of candor request when there's a complaint, which I think maybe is not, not quite what we would suggest. It's more a case that if, if there is a, a complaint and the duty of candor is running in parallel to that, or perhaps the complaint comes before the duty of candor was known about, um, that the two things often run in parallel and overlap. So if you're, if you're responding to a complaint, then in many cases, you'll be fulfilling most of the requirements for the duty of candor response in any event. And I think that it's, it's important just to be aware that one and the other can run in parallel and overlap. Really important point, Jared. yeah. Do you have anything to add? Um, no, not, not specifically, I don't think. I'm, I'm just seeing that an awful lot of questions have come in quite late and I'd quite like to, if I wouldn't mind just trying to address some of these ones as well. Um, so what, there was a question here about the, the differences between the duty of candour between England and Wales. Can you give us a quick rundown of that one, Mike? Would you be able to do that? Yeah, I can. I'll do it as briefly as I can because I realise we're running short of time. Essentially, it's going to be very, very similar. Um, it does uh, talk about um, a threshold of more than uh, minimal harm. What that is likely to be in practice, though, is moderate harm or worse. It's still being worked through various workshops and it will be subject to consultation next year, but the thresholds will be similar. Um, and like the rest of UK, it's an organisational duty. There is no criminal sanction. So it's very much as expected. Wales is a little bit more complex because you have the redress scheme putting things right. Um, and they will be looking at how those two processes overlap, which I think links into really one of the points that Ed's just made that you often get processes running into parallel. Okay. Um, how are we doing for time? Is there, is there time to squeeze one one further question in or comments? Ed, do you have anything else you want to to, to get in? And unfortunately, as ever happened, we this is what often happens that there are a lot of questions coming in the end, which makes it difficult to to answer them all and I apologise for that but what we'll do is we'll go through these questions afterwards and we often try and, and publish some answers for these and provide them to the attendees at the, at the, uh, the webinar so don't worry if we haven't got to your question we will have a look at it um, and we'll come back to you about them. Yeah. Do either Jared or Ed you'd want to say something just before we close about the other um, educational um, offerings that we have on duty of candor. So yeah, just yeah. so anyone wants to know more. I, mean, I think the point, I think the difficulty is that it's a, it's a complicated area uh, um, and uh, the legislation behind it and the guidance behind it is quite complicated and well, there's a lot of guidance on the website which people can access and members can access and uh, on top of that we've got um, seminars which can be provided um, at a GP level within the practice by sales staff. We run regular webinars like this and some lunchtime webinars as well. And we've got a website um, uh, where people can access the information. So it's www.themdu.com forward slash learn. Um, there's a lot of information there as well. Um, uh, and it will include it's a growing suite of e-learning and videos and such like. So people can get a lot of information from there and of course at the end of the day if you're struggling with this sort of question these are the sort of things that we're here to help you with so please do pick up the phone and use the advice line that's that's what it's there for absolutely and Ed I, I sort of know that um, hopefully it'll restart again soon but you were um, our, our, our go-to person for duty of candor and you were doing very sort of helpful um, seminars yeah, we used to run back back in the old days, back pre-COVID, um, <laughs> we to, to meet people face to face and shake hands and the like. We we did run a full day seminar um, on duty of candor, uh, which was yeah. much more in depth than what we can achieve here. Uh, and certainly, hopefully, we're hoping to get that back up and running, either face to face or partially face to face, partially online, in the near future. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, I think, unfortunately, we've just gone slightly over our allotted time. Um, I know that large numbers of you have stayed with us throughout um, this evening's presentation and discussion. Um, thank you so much for that, because I realise it encroaches on your own free time. We are really grateful that you make the time to join us. We hope it's been useful and uh, we hope to see you at one of our webinars very, very soon. So from myself, from Gerard and from Ed. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye.